it was actually Amita Ghosh's deeply evocative book, The Glass Palace, that first got me interested in the last king of Burma and his family. Curiosity as to what happened to the family after the king's um, deposition and exile to India is what made me start researching the subject. Uh, the, this talk is based on the research that I did for my book. Uh, for me, it was a human interest story, uh, which I set in its historical, political, um, cultural, and social context, without which it wouldn't have had much meaning. Uh, my talk will be in three parts, before the exile, during the exile, and after the exile. Um, King Thibaut belonged to the Kobang dynasty, a dynasty whose kings were known as kings who rule the universe. They were treated as demigods by their subjects. In fact, their subjects were regarded as their slaves. Uh, his queen, Queen Supyala, is supposed to have been the real, real ruler um, during their seven-year reign, which was from 1878 to 1885. They ruled from the Golden Palace in Mandalay until they were deposed by the British, who made uh, Burma part of the British Empire and exiled the king and his family to India. Uh, this is a photograph of King Thibaut and Queen Supyalat in their state robes, sitting on the lion throne. This and the next few slides will give you a sense of the splendor of the court during King Thibaut's reign. Uh, this is a betel nut box that used to belong to King Thibaut. Uh, it's in the shape of a karawek, which is a mythical bird and which is a symbol of longevity. Uh, it's made of solid gold and as you may be able to see, it's completely studded with rubies. Uh, this betel nut box belonged to another member of the royal family. It's a large box. In fact, it has two golden trays inside. It's also made of solid gold and it's also completely inlaid with rubies. Um, apart from betel nut boxes, all spoons, plates, um, serving bowls, even trays that the royal family used during King Thibaut's rule were made of solid gold. This is a wooden comb mounted with gold and um, set with uncut emeralds, emeralds and uh, rubies. Uh, it would have belonged to a court lady, perhaps one of Queen Supyalat's maids of honor. Uh, it would have been part of a cosmetic box known as a beard which would have contained other items like um, a bottle of perfume, uh, a few tresses of hair, um, oil, and of course, thanaka, which is the ubiquitous cosmetic used by Burmese, both as a form of makeup uh, and as a sunscreen. This painting represents the most spectacular possession of King Thibaut's the Namok ruby. It was 80 carats in weight, almost flawless, pigeon blood in color, and is supposed to have had great luminosity. Uh, they say it was worth the kingdom. Uh, this shows a, a French valuer saying that he just couldn't put a value on it because it was just indescribably valuable. There are many versions to how this ruby disappeared. It disappeared the day King Thibaut left his kingdom and it has never been traced. There were eight thrones in the palace. Uh, this is a painting showing the uh, position of the lion throne. The lion throne was gilded. It was um, ornate and rich in symbolic carving, including that of the lion that uh, uh, denoted bravery, uh, the lotus, which symbolized purity, and the dancing peacock, which was the emblem of the Burmese royal family. 33 gods of the Tavatimsa heaven, uh, which is a heaven in Buddhist cosmology, were carved on top of the throne, symbolically protecting the king and indicating that he was their agent on earth. Uh, this is a photograph of the palace. It shows the Piyatat, 
uh, which is a seven-tiered wooden, wooden spire, which stood directly over the lion throne. Uh, this point was grandly said to represent the center of the universe. The kings of this dynasty were really glorified. Um, they were known as kings of the universe. They ruled from the center of the universe and they were known as agents of the gods. This is a recent photograph of the Fiatha. Uh, the original palace was bombed and burned down during World War II. And this is, um, it was reconstructed in the 80s, 1980s. Uh, the palace was not just one building, but um, a cluster of 120 buildings. Each of these buildings was highly stylized, was very intricately carved, and was richly gilded. Um, it is said that the palace could not fail to uh, dazzle and impress. It was, uh, somebody described it as a glittering jewel. The size of the palace buildings varied. This is Queen Supyalat's apartment. Um, this and the next slide are of old lithographs, uh, which give you different views of the Golden Palace. Um, this is facing east, so you can see the uh, Shan Hills in the distance. Um, this view faces west, and in the distance you can see the uh, Irrawaddy River. This is to give you an idea of the intricacy of the carvings um, inside and outside the palace buildings. Unfortunately, the reconstructed um, palace doesn't have this kind of richness. Uh, this building used to be King uh, Thibault's father's apartment. Uh, after the old king died, King Thibault had the apartment moved outside the palace walls um, as a donation to the city. For many years, it was used as a monastery. It survived the bombing during World War II because it wasn't inside the palace grounds. Everything was splendidly ornate. This is a photograph of uh, King Thibault's barge. This is how uh, Queen Supyalat and the ladies of the court dressed. The queen's uh, dressing ritual was very elaborate and was very precise. Everything was done in the exact order every single day. Uh, first, her hair was tied on in a top knot, and then um, a, a diamond pin was inserted and fresh flowers were put in her hair. Uh, tanaka was carefully applied to her face. A rich silk tamian or a lungi was wrapped around her waist. Her feet were slipped into crimson velvet slippers. Uh, the royal family was allowed to wear slippers on the uh, palace platform, but nobody else could. Um, they all had to go barefoot. Um, this, is, this, this is the silk, uh, another silk cloth, the yinzi, was uh, tightly wrapped around her chest, and a pure muslin um, jacket was put on top. Lastly, she was bedecked with jewels made of diamonds and rubies and emeralds, necklaces, bracelets, earrings, rings, etc. Uh, this breast cloth, this yinzi, actually belonged to Queen Sukhyala. A British soldier stole it from her apartment after the deposition. This lady is supposed to have been the best dancer in the whole kingdom. She often danced for the king and queen. Her movement is supposed to have been very, very graceful. Um, it was described that as being as graceful as a blade of grass moving in the breeze. The king and queen were entertained almost every single evening uh, with performances called pues. Uh, sometimes Kwe's had elegant dances, some told religious stories from the Jatakas, uh, other Kwe's dealt with social or uh, political issues. Uh, the king and queen sat on cushions, and behind them sat an ocean of um, maids of honor. Queen Supyalat is supposed to have had 300 maids of honor. 
uh, a golden gem of encrusted betel nut box was placed near the king um, and also a golden spittoon. Behind the queen sat um, a maid of honor who would roll fresh cheroots for her to smoke uh, during the, uh, the, uh, the play. Smoking was very common in Burma. It says that everyone smoked, almost everyone smoked, these very large hand-rolled cheroots. Um, what was interesting for me to hear was that even children were encouraged to smoke. Um, it was common for kings of Burma to have many queens. Uh, king Thibaw's father, King Minden, is supposed to have had uh, 61 queens. However, Queen Supyalat, as I mentioned, was a very strong lady, and um, she absolutely refused that King Thibaw uh, could take another queen after her. But as a result of a particularly fascinating intrigue, which sadly I don't have time to go into, and there were many such intrigues in the palace, uh, Queen Supyalak agreed to have her younger sister marry King Thibaut. Uh, this is a photograph uh, uh, showing Queen Supyagale, the junior queen, Queen Supyalak, and King Thibaut. Uh, this is a photograph of Queen Supyalak with some of her maids of honor and visitors. Uh, when visiting the king or queen, everyone had to sit in this crouching or shako. It was known as the shako position. The king of Burma was patron of Buddhism. He was both the patron and the protector of Buddhism in his kingdom. Uh, but the animistic worship of Nats or spirit beings were deeply woven into the fabric of their beliefs. Additionally and interestingly, many Indian gods were worshipped in Burma. And this was for an interesting reason. Uh, Theravada Buddhism shunned any kind of ritual. And in order to um, have a sense of majesty, a sense of magic, a sense of mystery uh, in the court, uh, Brahmanic rituals and Vedic ceremonies were imported from India. Um, the, of course, Indian gods in Burma were adapted to Burmese sensibilities. This is a slide of Lord Indra, or Kyajamin, as he's known in Burma. Uh, this is Goddess Saraswati, or Thuratati. And this is Lord Ganesha, known as Mahapien in Burma. Uh, this lithograph depicts the scene of King Thibaut's uh, surrender to the British. Um, the British had given King Thibaut the option to place his kingdom as a feudatory uh, of British India. King Thibaut refused, war was declared, and the British forces came up the Irrawaddy River, which pretty much runs vertically up uh, from Lower Burma to Upper Burma. They came in a flot flotilla that is supposed to have extended five miles, and the war was over in three weeks, almost before it began. Uh, King Thibaut's defeat brought to an end 133 years of um, Kobang dynasty rule. After he surrendered, the king requested that in order to preserve a little bit of his dignity in front of his people, that he be allowed uh, to leave on elephant back. Uh, the British refused. Uh, he and his family were taken away into bullock carts of the kind commonly used in Burma in those days. Um, this is a painting in the VNA Museum of the scene of King Thibaut and his family's departure from his capital and kingdom. Um, on either side, you have two rows of bayonet-holding soldiers. Under the white umbrellas, you see the royal family. The two bullock carts that are to take them away are standing on the side. And in the background, you could see the golden palace. The British had in 1826 and in 1853 gobbled up parts of, the, of Burma. 
in order to justify the rest of the of, of colonizing the rest of Burma, um, the British press painted King uh, Thibaut and Queen Sukyalat as darkly malevolent and and totally inept. Um, it's true that King Thibaut was not a particularly good king, but he certainly wasn't the drunkard that they portrayed him to be. Uh, here is a cartoon from the Punch magazine. Um, it shows King Thibaut depicted as a Burmese toad being booted out of his pond or kingdom by the British. A bottle of brandy is falling from his hand. Uh, in the background, you can see crouching the French frog, well armed, but not able to do anything. Uh, the French, as you know, were competing colonial powers during this period. Uh, this is a lithograph of King Thibaut and his family arriving in Prome. Uh, that's a depiction of their steamer. Uh, it, they were taken down the Irrawaddy River from um, Mandalay to Rangoon. In Rangoon, the family was moved to another steamer. And while they were birthed in Rangoon for five days, um, and King Thibaut requested for permission to be allowed to visit the Shwedagon Pagoda, uh, the British refused. From Rangoon, the family was taken to Madras. Queen Sukhyalat was pregnant at the time of the deposition, and uh, she delivered um, a baby in Madras. A month after the delivery, uh, the family was shifted to Ratnagiri. Uh, we now come to part two of the talk. Uh, this is a photograph showing um, a part of Ratnagiri, which was known as the native town uh, in the days of the British. Um, having been stripped of his power and most of his exile, uh, most of his wealth, uh, the family was exiled to Ratnagiri for over 31 years. Uh, Ratnagiri was a very culturally alien and very remote town for the family. Uh, in this town, they were kept under virtual imprisonment, uh, and a series of um, designated officers managed almost every aspect of the family's life. The government, however, did make an effort to make the family comfortable. The princesses, sadly, were not sent to school, and they had no one to socialize with other than each other and their staff. Uh, Ratnagiri was carefully selected by the British uh, because they wanted him completely isolated. Uh, in those days, there was no railway connection to Ratnagiri, and a steamer used to come from Bombay um, to bring visitors and goods and supplies to Ratnagiri. Of course, no steamer could operate during the monsoons. Um, there, there was a population of around 11,000 in Ratnagiri that uh, when King Thibaut arrived there, and it was mainly an agricultural and fishing economy. King Thibaut hated Ratnagiri from the day he arrived. It was just so very different from everything he had ever known. As I mentioned, the British did try to make the family comfortable. Two of the finest bungalows in Ratnagiri uh, were rented for the king and his entourage. Uh, this is Outram Hall, which was used for the, uh, um, for the entourage. Uh, the other bungalow, Baker's Bungalow, was occupied by the royal family. Unfortunately, Baker's Bungalow no longer stands uh, but this is part of the plot that it was on. Uh, the, the, both the houses, um, Baker's Bungalow and Outram Hall, were in one compound that was about two and a half acres in size. This idol used to belong to King Thibaut. The pagoda that King Thibaut had built for it no longer stands, uh, but I was interested to see I must have taken this picture in 2005 or 2006 uh, that the idol is still worshipped. Uh, it's today on that empty plot of land that Baker's bungalow stood, uh, uh, stood on. This is the ruins of the pagoda. Um, 
as I mentioned, it's on the plot of land that Baker's bungalow was, and it's abutting the uh, Outram Hall compound. Um, you can see the idol in the distance. That's the only part of the pagoda that is still somewhat preserved. This is the home that King Thibaut was moved to in 1910. Uh, it is today known as Thibaut Palace. It was constructed in consultation with the king and it stood in a 27 acre compound located in one of the best areas of Ratnagiri. Uh, the building had 16 very spacious rooms and had a carpet area of around, not around, but exactly 25,000 uh, square feet. Um, when the family went to see the home before they moved into it, Queen Supyalat noticed that there was an emblem of very British design on the uh, terrace. Uh, she strongly objected to this and she wanted the dancing peacock, the emblem of the Burmese royal family, put in its place. Uh, the Brit and she just said, I won't move until that's done. The British obliged. Uh, the King, King Thibaut was so far away from his homeland, uh, had no influence in his homeland anymore. In fact, he'd so, uh, pretty much towed the British line during the 15 years that he was in exile. And uh, by now they were happy to hand out small favors, actually 25 years, by now this is 25 years. Uh, this is the very spacious two-story Darbar Hall that uh, King Thibaut received the visitors that he was permitted to. This is the courtyard of the residence. The princess's rooms were, this is the front showing the front of the um, palace, the, the residence. At the back of the residence were the princess's rooms that were connected with, uh, they were connected by corridors. Thibaut Palace is now a museum and unfortunately only two of the rooms are well preserved and um, open to the public. Uh, this room holds a few of uh, King Thibaut's pieces of furniture. Oops, sorry, I don't know. Uh, this is the view from the residence, from the terrace of the residence. Uh, Queen Supyalat's granddaughter, Princess Tiek Supyaji, uh, told me that her mother, the fourth princess, told her that uh, Queen Supyalat would often stand at the terrace and gazed for hours over the sea, longing for her homeland. Um, there, are, there are hardly any pictures of the royal family in existence today of the, from the period when they were in exile. Um, I couldn't find one of Queen Sophia, but archival records show uh, that she who had been such a strong and powerful queen uh, during her rule, um, took the exile very hard. Uh, she fell into depression and is said to have aged prematurely. It was King Thibaut, a staunch Buddhist, and someone who had always been regarded as the weaker of the two, um, who found ways to cope during the exile. Uh, this is the view from a point that is commonly called Thibaut Point. It is said that King Thibaut would walk with an, with an entourage every evening to this uh, point and would sit in contemplation here for a while. This is a photograph of the third princess. She's the one who was born in Madras. Um, the princesses did not have common names, uh, but long titles. For example, the third princess was called Ashin Tiek Sumiat Fia. Their titles were very similar, and only the last word was different. Uh, then the last word indicated the order of their birth, uh, which was why the British uh, renamed the princesses numerically during the exile. Um, you may be interested to know that their titles meant exalted senior mistresses of the uh, head group of goddesses. King Thibaut never stopped thinking of himself as king, never mind his very reduced circumstances. In 1908, uh, he gave as a housewarming gift to a lawyer he used very occasionally in Ratnagiri, um, two silver dancing peacocks, 
a solid gold, fairly small in size compared to the betel nut boxes that he used to own, but solid gold and embedded with rubies, diamonds, and a few emeralds, and a large diamond ring. Uh, the lawyer's grandson allowed me to take photographs of these pieces. Now, just a few years later, this is 1911. Um, 1908 was when he gave that extravagant gift to the lawyer. Uh, the king had run out of most of his possessions. And the king wrote this letter, that's his signature at the bottom, uh, asking for the government for 5,000 rupees to contribute towards his sister's funeral. She had just died in Mandalay. This is the only existing photograph of the four princesses together. It was taken in 1914, uh, right after their ear boring ceremony. Uh, ear boring ceremony is like an ear piercing ceremony. Uh, this is a very traditional ceremony in Burma. Um, it's not as common today as it used to be, um, but it was significantly delayed for the princesses. It was, it was usually held around the time of puberty, uh, but the princesses' ages ranged from 27 to 34 um, when the ceremony was held for them. They ranged, um, this, is the, this is the fourth princess who was 27 at the time, the first princess who was 34, um, the third princess and the second princess. This is a photograph of the third and the fourth princess after their ear boring ceremony. Um, you'll notice the umbrellas, which signifies the presence of royalty. Uh, this is a photograph of King Thibaut taken during his daughter's uh, ear boring ceremony. Although the British allowed to, um, for him to conduct this ceremony in style with guests and monks and bands from Burma, uh, it was not as grand as he wanted it to be. Uh, the people in front of him are in very elaborate ceremonial robes uh, that they wore for special occasions. King Thibaut died in 1916 that is 31 years after his exile, without ever stepping foot on his homeland again. Uh, this photograph uh, was taken during his funeral ceremonies. A few years after he died, um, he, and after the end of World War I, the family was permitted to return to Burma. King Thibaut's tomb is on the left in Ratnagiri. Uh, queen Supya Gale, the junior queen, had died a few years before him, and her mortal remains lie in the same tomb as him. Um, on the right-hand side is the tomb of the first princess. She had fallen in love with a palace servant during the exile, had had a daughter with him, and had decided to settle in Ratnagiri after the exile ended. This is the emblem of the Burmese royal family that I took from one of King Thibaut's and the death of the third princess who died in 1962. She was the last of the princesses to pass away. Uh, but I soon realized that for a sense of closure, um, I needed to look at the lives of the princess's children uh, because their lives were so intertwined with those of their mothers and they also were very impacted by both the exile and their lineage. Um, this is the last page of a letter that the first princess wrote. In, uh, because of their long exile in Ratnagiri, um, they were conversant in Marathi and Hindi, a little bit of Goan. Um, and the second princess that what do you think we're going to give you permission to marry a slave? Um, additionally, the king whose health was failing around this time died a couple of months after the second princess's elopement and the queen blamed the second princess um, for, his death, for his death. This is a photograph of the second princess. Uh, they always dressed very elegantly in Burmese style and they always felt very, very entitled to largesse from the government. Uh, queen Supyalat is uh, once said, that I found it in the um, archives, that it is not given to us to earn our own living. 
this is true for all the princesses, and it wasn't just arrogance, their upbringing. Uh, this is the second princess in 1956. Her husband had just died a few years earlier. He died in 1952, and she was keen to go back to Burma. Uh, here she is with her son, Mong Luji, and uh, uh, Fonji, that's a, a Burmese Buddhist monk, uh, who offered to accompany her to Burma. Uh, sadly, she died en route in Calcutta. This is the third princess and her family. Uh, that's the third princess. She eventually settled in Maimyo, which is a hill station not far from Mandalay. Maimyo was, a summer, was the uh, summer capital of India during the British Raj. I'm told she was the most vivacious and charming of the princesses, and she was supposed to have been Queen Sophialat's favorite child. Uh, here she is, sorry, with her um, grandchildren. That's her daughter, Princess Rita. And that's her um, son-in-law, Prince Tophia. The home and uh, uh, ambitious of the princess. Early 1930s, she made a very audacious bid for the return of her father's kingdom. She was living in Mandalay uh, at this time, and for this piece of impersonal uh, in, in order to settle in Ratnagiri, she, she was sent back to uh, Burma along with the rest of the family, and she pleaded to be allowed to return to Mandalay. And in order to be able to do this, um, the British stripped her of her title of uh, princess, and uh, she was not given, she was given a very tiny allowance compared to her sisters. This is Queen Supyalat's tomb in uh, Rangoon. She died in 1925. Although she was allowed to go back to Burma in 1919, she was never allowed to step foot in Mandalay. Uh, the British considered her to have been too powerful a queen, and they didn't want to risk her becoming the rallying point for a anti-British nationalistic movement. As word of her return to Burma spread, People came from all over Burma, from, including from Mandalay, uh, to visit her. And she held daily audiences um, in her residence. At last, she felt she was getting the respect and attention she thought she deserved. And soon, you know, it was apparent to those around her that age and the long years of captivity had neither uh, dimmed her uh, spirit or her wit. Uh, now I'm going to show you slides of uh, four grandchildren of King Thibo, who I interviewed for my book. Uh, this is Mong Luji, the second princess's son. Uh, here he's carrying his mother's ashes that he had held on to for over 50 years in the hope of returning them to Burma. Uh, he always remembered that his mother had wanted to go back to Burma. Finally, in 2008, he was able to send the ashes back to Burma. And uh, exactly two weeks after he heard that his mother's ashes had been entombed in her homeland, he passed away. Uh, this is Princess Tiek Sufia Ji. She's the fourth princess's daughter and lives in Rangoon. She talks with a very clipped British accent. And for most of her life, she earned a living um, working with companies, with consulates and embassies, and um, teaching English, the language that her grandmother absolutely refused to learn. She carries herself with great confidence, is very sharp and witty, and does not hesitate at all to voice her opinion. Uh, in her, I glimpsed Queen Sufyalat. She is the only grandchild of King Thibaut's alive today. Uh, sadly, she's become very frail and uh, pretty much bedridden. She's 97 years old now. This is Prince Tophia, who lived with the third princess in Memeo. He was actually the fourth princess's son, and he'd married his first cousin, the third princess's daughter. Uh, he was a very warm and generous uh, human being and wrote me countless long handwritten letters about his family. Uh, once when I wrote to him and when I was going to be visiting him in Memeo to ask him what I could bring for him, uh, you would you'll be astonished as to what he asked for. He asked for Simla apples. Uh, he said that his mother had loved them in Ratnagiri and all he got now in Memeo were horrible Chinese apples. 
he was very keen to uh, taste the Simla apple that his mother had loved so much. He also told me that all the princesses and all their children enjoyed Indian food. Prince Tofia sadly passed away about a year ago. This is Prince Tofia Gale, also the fourth princess's son. Uh, he was the most socially conscious and politically active of, the, um, of King Thibault's grandchildren. In fact, he was jailed on multiple occasions by the military for his activism. Uh, he died in 2006. I only met him once, but we exchanged uh, numerous emails and phone calls before he died. Uh, that's his daughter, Devi Tansin. She's also an activist, but an environmental activist. She doesn't dabble in political affairs. That's a photograph of Tutu, and sadly, I never met her. She's the only child of the first princess. She experienced very deep prejudice from a very young age, including from her own grandmother and the other princesses or aunts. Uh, even her father seemed to be totally indifferent to her. Uh, perhaps because she fe uh, felt so unloved and stigmatized as she was growing up, she took in 18 unwanted babies. Apparently, uh, people who had children out of wedlock would come and leave them at her doorstep, confident in the knowledge that they would be looked after. Most of these children she gave up for adoption, but she raised four of them on her own. According to one of her adopted daughters, who I interviewed, uh, this is uh, Tara, uh, she told me that she was Queen Sufyalit's favorite, uh, sorry, she was uh, Tutu's favorite child. Apart from babies, Tutu also adopted stray dogs, wounded animals, and arranged low-cost marriages for, um, she, she, she arranged uh, low-cost marriages for people from disadvantaged backgrounds. In short, this very remarkable lady did not let a harsh and impoverished existence kill her innate generosity and kindness. Uh, December 16th, 2016 was King Thibault's 100th death anniversary. Many family members of his, along with leading Buddhist monks and the head of uh, Burma's military, Senior General Ming Ong Lang, came to Ratnagiri to pay their respect at the tomb. Uh, the royal family in Burma has been longing for a long, uh, has been uh, lobbying for a long time uh, to get his and Queen Sophia Gale's mortal remains back to Burma. Thibaut Palace was all spruced up for this occasion. I hope it will be renovated inside also and will continue to be well maintained because it really is a beautiful historic building and in, with, it has an interesting blend of both Burmese and Indian architecture. The tombs were also spruced up for the occasion. Uh, these are two of King Thibaut's great granddaughters. That's Maltitai More, the granddaughter of the first princess, and Do Devi Kin, the granddaughter of the um, fourth princess. One is totally Indian, the other is totally Burmese. They met for the first time during King Thibaut's death centenary commemoration and discovered that other than common grandparents, common great-grandparents, they have no other commonality, not even a language. This is um, Uso Win, the fourth princess's grandson and the present head of the Burmese royal family. Uh, the family has no political significance today in Burma, but many in Burma still hold sentimental value for the royal family and a feeling a um, strong feeling that the, Burmese, that the family has been very wronged by the colonial powers. During British rule, news of the royal family was suppressed in Burma. After independence, which was on um, January 4th, uh, 1948, about six months after our independence, attention in Burma naturally shifted to rebuilding the nation. Uh, but unfortunately, the country was almost immediately embroiled in turmoil. Insurgents, both ethnic and um, communist, stymied any progress, and by 1962, the military had taken over Burma. 
the military also suppressed any news of the Burmese royal family. It's only been in the last eight years or so as Burma moves more towards a dem democratic form of uh, government that the Burmese have had a chance to reclaim and understand their history, uh, including that of their last king and his family. Thank you very much. Thank you so very, very much, Sudha. Great story, told with a great amount of feeling. And you almost made the riches come alive, and you made the, the pathos and the family and the descendants really come alive. Uh, while the compliments have kept on flowing while you were speaking, there have been questions also. So I will take the oppor opportunity to ask my question first. Sure. Uh, what did Thibaut really think of the British and how he was treated? Uh, you know, uh, King Thibaut in many ways was quite guileless and he was a very, um, he held no animosity against the British. In fact, for me, one fascinating incident which was told to me by one of his grandchildren is that as a devout Buddhist, when he used to say his prayers every day, he would uh, pray for happiness of all sentient beings. And Queen Supyalat, who had been observing this for some time, uh, said that when you include everyone, you're including the British too, and you should exclude them. And uh, he said, no, the British are uh, people too. And he, I blame my karma. I blame uh, my deeds of the past. I don't hold a grudge against anybody. He honestly held no grudge. So he was more in his own realm and, so, and the queen was more a woman of the world, so to speak. <laughs> I've, I've heard her refer to quite derisively as Queen Souplet. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Thanks to uh, Rudyard Kipling. Yes. Uh, uh, in, in his years in uh, Ratnagiri, did Thibaut ever interact with Indian freedom fighters? To your knowledge, did he interact with, say, Lokmanya Tilak? Because uh, Tilak no. was from Ratnagiri. Right. No, he didn't. Um, I think it was, he died in 1916. Uh -huh. uh, and his, he was very closely monitored by the British. He was allowed visitors, uh, but they, they did not allow anyone who they deemed to be any kind of a threat. Okay. Um, what was the family allowed to bring with them from uh, uh, the, uh, when they were sent off from Mandalay? Uh, besides the entourage, were they allowed to bring their personal uh, wealth? Well, whatever they could collect, they were given 24 hours. They were given the, uh, until the next morning. Uh, the British marched into the palace on the 28th of uh, November, 1885. And he had to leave his kingdom on the 29th of November. And uh, whatever they could collect and keep with themselves, uh, they were allowed to take. Um, but sadly, they entrusted a lot of their more valuable possessions uh, with a Colonel Sladen uh, when they left, saying that, you know, they gave it to him for self-keeping because there was massive looting of the palace that night between the 28th and the 29th. And um, they left Burma with just what they had been able to store. And when they asked for the, their possessions that had been left with Colonel Sladen, uh, they were told that they were not entitled to it. It was prize of war. Uh, yeah, prize of war for the British. What a tragic night that must have been. Absolutely horrendous. They feared for their lives too that night. And so how la large was their personal entourage, would you say? And uh, beside, uh, besides the, the king and the queen and the two princesses, right? Um, so there then, other yeah, family there were two, members. The other two princesses were born in India. Um, the entourage, when they left Mandalay, comprised almost um, 80 people. Uh, but when they reached Rangoon and they realized that the king was being exiled to India, uh, many of um, these followers just dropped out. So I, if I remember right, it was about 16 of his original people who were allowed to go, uh, who went with him to Rangoon. Ashish wants to know how and why did you take up this painstaking task um, 
of a, what he calls a relatively obscure family. I guess you mentioned in the beginning uh, that you were sort of inspired by Amitabh Ghosh's book. Is there something yeah, you'd like I, to add to that? Yeah, you know, I was absolutely fascinated by his book and uh, the intention was really not to write a book myself, but just to read more about the king and his family. Mm -hmm. uh, and I discovered very soon after um, I began my research that although there was a wealth of information of the family uh, during their rule, there was not much about them either during the exile or after the exile. And um, to my great delight, I found that Ratnagiri had been in the Bombay presidency. So a bulk of the archival material was in Bombay, in Elphinstone College, in the Maharashtra archives. And the British had been such meticulous record keepers. Um, an officer visited the king twice a day and recorded everything from the kind of flowers he liked to every mundane conversation that he had. So it was like a treasure trove for me. Um, was second queen in exile too? The, the, the sister of uh, yes. the first queen? She yes. was Queen Supya Gale. In fact, she died in Ratnagiri in 19, uh, 1912. She was the one who really brought up the princesses because Queen Supyala uh, slipped into deep depression. The second queen had no children of, of her own? She, she had miscarriage after miscarriage. She, no, she had no children of her own. Um, uh, the resources that were available to Thiba and the family, what was the pension that he was allowed and where did he derive his uh, income from? Uh, the pension began, it was arbit rather arbitrarily decided. As the British um, said, they wanted him to live well, but not in any kingly manner. Mm -hmm. The amount that was decided, I feel rather arbitrarily, was 3,000 rupees a month. Uh, which in those days was not too small, or am small an amount. Mm. Uh, but King Tibo had carried, um, as I mentioned, you know, even the things they ate out of, even their serving bowls and trays were made of solid gold. Uh, they carried a lot of gems with them. So over the years, they sold a lot of their possessions. And uh, King Tibo was... Um, he was a spendthrift, as one British officer described him, an amiable old spendthrift. Okay. Um, he had no control. He borrowed madly in Ratnagiri. I found, I saw a promissory note with his grocer's great, great, great grandson that King Thibaut had given for a loan of 5,000 rupees. So he supplemented whatever pension he got from the government by selling his possessions and by borrowing. Mm. What's a king, always a king. <laughs> uh, did Thiba and the queen uh, finally approve of their first daughter's marriage or uh, no, she was no. persona non grata? No, she was, she was a persona, uh, she was not treated well at all. But, you know, there are conflicting reports. Um, when the, I think when, the, when Tutu was first born, she must have been a cute little kid. She had, did have Burmese features. The family was bored. They were isolated. Um, apparently, Queen Sufiala did play with her and, um, you know, did take interest in her and allowed the first princess to visit Gopal, uh, who was her lover, uh, in his um, hut, which was in the, at the entrance of the compound. It's like a police jockey at the entrance of the uh, palace grounds. But I think over the years, the prejudices um, surfaced. Uh, as uh, Tutu grew a little older, her Indian, Indian features became a little more apparent. Also, as visitors from Burma came, there was a housewarming ceremony. Um, then there was this ear boring ceremony where people from Burma came. Now, Burmese kings and queens so believed in the purity of their dynasty that King Tibor and Queen Sufiala had the same father. They were half brother sister. So that was the extent that they went to preserve the purity. Now, Gopal was not only not Burmese, not a Buddhist, he certainly wasn't uh, anything that the king and queen wanted. So no, over the years, the prejudice grew greater and greater and they treated her very shabbily towards the end of the exile, yeah. the family. 
Uh, do we know if there are any connections to Bombay of the of the descendants? Yes, there are descendants in Bombay. Uh huh. And um, they would be Ratnagiri, like Ratnagiri. Um, you know, although it's much, it much uh, has much more employment opportunity today uh, than it had at King Thibaut's time. Uh, his uh, Tutu's children were also not very well educated and uh, opportunities were more in Bombay. So quite a few of them did shift to Bombay. So they would be descendants of the first princess? They are all descendants of the first princess. Okay. Uh, somebody wanted to know what was the name of the first princess's husband? Gopal, you said? Gopal Savan. Savan. Uh, he, he was called Shivrekar. I think that was the clan or um, I don't know how exactly how it, it worked. But his name was uh, Gopal Savant, and the first princess used to uh, refer to him as Shivrekar. He was a Maratha. Apparently, he was um, uh, sort of he was a handsome, tall, well-respected man in Ratnagiri. Okay. Uh, you mentioned tombs uh, uh, in the in the housing colony in uh, Ratnagiri. Uh, considering they were Buddhists, would the tombs have ashes after their cremation or were they buried? Uh, no, uh, Burmese uh, royalty are never buried, they're entombed, they're never put underground. Um, so the tomb was constructed, Burmese design, they got um, the design, the, the British government made a lot of inquiries in Mandalay. Uh, of course, they restricted the cost, so it wasn't as grand as... Um, it might have been suggested, um, but there was an opening and um, the bodies of King Thibaut and uh, Queen Sophia Gale, actually they were entombed quite many years, three years after King Thibaut died. He was first kept, he was um, preserved and kept in the palace grounds. But when they were about to leave for Burma, Queen Sophia requested for permission to take the bodies of her sister and her husband back to Burma. That's when the British insisted that they be entombed. And um, the tombs that you saw, they were entombed there in 1919. And uh, when the first princess died, the, a similar tomb was built next to King Thibault's. First princess was cremated. Um, there was a question from Amit. Would you know what Thibault's favorite food was? Um, there was archival record during uh, his time in Ratnagiri that he used to fall sick uh, frequently because of his fondness of pork. Okay. He used to eat it very frequently. Uh, a related question on and, food. And they built a piggery, I know, in Ratnagiri, in Ratnagiri after okay. a few years because the family kept wanting pork. And a related question was, do you find today any influences of, of, Burma, of the cuisine of Burma and what is available in Ratnagiri? Yes, uh, not in Ratnagiri per se, but some of the descendants um, of the uh, uh, Burmese, of the first princess. In fact, during this uh, ceremony in 2016, uh, there was a British filmmaker and family members and we went to uh, Malti Tai, who is uh, Tutu's daughter. And she had made her version of uh, uh, Mohinga, which is a little bit like Houseway, but a more Burmese um, dish. Okay. Uh, the same Amit wanted to know, did he listen to the radio? I'm not sure if that's a valid question, because as far as we know, radio came to India about 12 years after Thibaut passed away. Um, I never heard of him listening to the radio, but certainly Queen Sukhyala, was very fond of reading the papers. And they did get papers. Uh, the British allowed them to get papers from Burma. But uh, although the, Bur the British restricted news um, in Burmese papers about the royal family, if some news happened to slip in or if there was something they did not want the king or queen to see, they would withhold the paper of that okay. time. And that used to frighten King Thibault greatly because he was wondering what they were plotting and planning. I'm almost visualizing the queen with a chirut in her hand and reading the newspaper. <laughs> well, one of their main complaints and one of the people they asked for was someone who could roll fresh chiruts for them in oh. <laughs> during the exam. 
Okay, we've come to the final question. Uh, it's a very large one. It's got a great uh, panorama. What was the political situ situation in Burma at the time of uh, sending him off to exile? And would things have been different if uh, uh, the king had acceded to the British's terms and conditions? Um, well, let me start with the conditions in Burma. Um, we're talking of Upper Burma because um, uh, two chunks of Burma had already been colonized. That was Lower Burma, which had all the seaports and which also had the um, Erewadi Delta and was the main rice um, growing region of Burma. Now, uh, rice is a staple uh, diet of the Burmese, or as someone very picturesquely put it, the, the wunsa, the food of the womb for the Burmese. So the upper, upper Burma had to import rice and the British at that time were exporting rice, so the rice prices had spiraled. So the economics in Burma, uh, Upper Burma, was poor. It was really, really um, not a, a good situation economically. Uh, secondly, um, there was a lot of dacoits moving around in Upper Burma because the king had lost his power in many ways. The reason for that was that uh, large chunks had already been colonized and the, the Shan kingdoms realized that the um, king had lost power. So although they were supposed to send um, a, a tributary to him, they stopped doing so. Um, would things have been different? Um, sorry, what was the last bit of the question? Yeah, would things have been different if Kiba had agreed to the British's terms and conditions? Um, you know, it's interesting, more than anything else, what mattered to the Burmese royalty was their pride and ego and saving face. As the uh, best well-known uh, historian of Burma, Thant Mintu says, that if you rob a Burmese king of that, he's left with nothing but his umbrella. Now, apparently, um, king Thibaw did consider the option of giving in to the ultimatum, uh, but he realized, and he really had realized that he really had no option because he would have lost all respect of his subjects. And as Queen Supyalat spelled out, it is better to be prisoners than to be slaves of, um, you know, to, to live as slaves, as puppets of the British. They, he really felt he had no option but to wage a war. And he was totally mis misled by his ministers who said that um, um, uh, he had a chance of winning. He lived in a bubble. He had no idea of the power of the British, that they were using machine guns at a time when they were using swords and spears and antiquated um, uh, five pound guns. So Sudha, that brings us to the end of all the questions. I am scared to ask anyone if they have more questions because I'm sure they'll start pouring in. I'd like to end with uh, a, a comment which has just come in from somebody called Tara Subramaniam. She writes, Sudha, I don't know whether you articulate better or write better. She's obviously read your book. <laughs> Very enjoyable evening and totally informative. Thank you. I think this sums up the sentiment of uh, virtually everybody who's written in. Thank you, everybody, and thank you once again, Sudha, for a great, great, great evening. Thank you so much, um, the whole team at Kaki, for having organized this.